thank you, Sandy, for the great introduction. And uh, thank you to Don Wills for sponsoring this talk. Uh, the title of my talk is Our Enemy, the State. Although having heard uh, Joe Solano's talk, I think my title should have been Lawyers and the State from Enemies to Friends. <laughs> because uh, really what I'm going to be talking about is how uh, lawyers are complicit in enabling the state to assault our liberties. They should be protecting us from the assault on our liberties, but on the contrary, they're the ones driving the assault on our liberties. So that's uh, really what my talk is uh, this morning. And I've drawn it from this book, this great book, Against the State by Lou Rockwell. He has a chapter, chapter three is called The Assault on Our Liberties. And I think many of you will be familiar with this. You will have uh, read this already. And so you will know what the argument is in that chapter, and you will be familiar with all the examples uh, discussed in that chapter. But what I want to do is uh, to give some contemporary examples. This book was published in uh, 2014, so I'm going to give some contemporary examples that illustrate the same argument. And um, I should uh, mention my gratitude uh, to David Gordon, who's not here today, he would have loved to be here. He would have been so much better at giving you this talk than I am, but uh, we've, uh, I'm just going to try and talk about many examples for which I'm grateful to him for his insight. And the essential argument in that chapter, the assault on our liberties, is that reminding people that the state intervention is backed by the use of force, because many people forget that. They say, oh, the state should ban this, the state should ban the other. They forget that that is backed by the use of force. And one of the points made in this chapter is that ultimately the use of force is backed by putting people in jail. I mean, there's the use of fines, uh, driving people bankrupt. Many of you will have seen the case of the Chicago baker who's been, uh, you know, he's been running through litigation for the last 12 years on the accusation that he has breached the civil rights of uh, people who are demanding that he should bake cakes that he doesn't want to bake, and drove him almost to the brink of bankruptcy. So it's financial penalties and ultimately jail. And that is what we mean when we talk about state intervention. People very cavalierly say, oh, the state should intervene. And it's good to remind them that they're saying people who disagree with what they're saying should go to jail. So that's the first point. It's saying the state should intervene is not simply a normative argument based on what we would like to see. It's based on a coercive argument of um, compulsion. So it's really important, I think, to draw the distinction between what we think, in our opinion, may be good or bad, and whether we think it should be mandated by the state or not. I think many of us remember during the, uh, the, the lockdown era when people were debating what is proper conduct, what is, uh, what is healthy behavior. There's a big difference between those types of debates and debates about mandates. People don't know that there's a distinction between saying something is good and saying the state should force everybody to do that thing because it's good or saying that something is bad and therefore people who don't do it should be locked up by the state. So that's the distinction that I uh, want to draw. Murray Rothbard, of course, was very clear as to the limits of state interventions. He regarded the state as the inherent enemy of liberty and indeed of genuine law. And it's the idea of genuine law that I want to focus on today. What did he mean by genuine law? And just uh, a spoiler alert, as many of you will already know, that Rothbard's view of genuine law was law that is based on two principles, the right to private property and the non-aggression principle. That's it. There is no other genuine law other than law derived from those two principles. And the state is the enemy of liberty because it comes up with all these uh, that are an assault on our liberty, that are supposedly doing good things. This is a point that's been made by many uh, good economists, for example, Walter Williams. He says, you can't just turn anything you think is a good thing into law. 
So you just uh, shift from saying this is a good thing and we would like to see this happen to, to saying there ought to be a law that makes that thing happen. Walter Williams said that legality alone cannot be the talisman of moral people. You can make moral arguments, and I think we all do that, if we're good people, we make moral arguments, but we don't follow that up by saying that ought to be the law. Uh, the latest example, there are so many examples of this, but the latest example of what the state is uh, doing to introduce morals as law is what they've called the war against hate. So they're saying there's a lot of hate. You know, if you listen to the Democrats, you will hear them always talking about how much hate there is, there's rising hate, and they want to make all these laws uh, that are going to eradicate hate and there'll be no more hate in the world. <laughs> and the main method they use to eradicate hate is what Rothbard called phony civil rights. Now, before I encountered Rothbard, I used to refer to civil rights as plastic civil rights, meaning they're just fake, they're fabricated, and they're malleable, and they can be used in any way. But I think Rothbard's terminology is better, phony civil rights, because sometimes plastic things can be useful, like plastic straws. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, but, but Rothbard is saying these are phony rights. They're phony, they're fake, and this applies to all the civil rights, because as he says, the only uh, rights, the only genuine rights are private property rights. So now we have a lot of legislation that's supposed to eradicate hate. And one feature that all this legislation has in common is that double standards apply. So a lot of people don't know this. They say, oh, it's against hate. Well, I'm against hate, so that's good. Let's have a law that's against hate. But what they don't realize is double standards apply. So you, you, you don't just check what's been said because typically they're trying to um, illegalize words. You don't just check what's been said, but you check who is saying it. So one of the words they were recently proposing to ban was the word field, you know, because they said, well, if you say you're going to do your field work, you know, the word field could trigger bad memories. People will remember about slavery because slaves used to work in fields. So if you, say, if you say you're doing your field work, you know, that's a microaggression and that should be banned. But then you'd be looking at who is saying the word field. And if it's, if it's a white person saying field, that's banned. And if it's a black person saying field, that's fine because they're not gonna trigger bad memories in themselves. So all this uh, legislation applies double standards. No genuine law can be based on people's race, their sex, their gender, or any other identity. That's why civil rights are phony. The war against thought crime targets all these kinds of ideas. It, we, it used to be called political incorrectness, not being polite to people. Then it was called discrimination, discriminating against people based on their inherent characteristics. Then we moved on to microaggressions. These are little aggressions based on things like how you look at people. Apparently, I remember one from Oxford University. They said, if you roll your eyes, that's a microaggression. If you roll your eyes when, you know, when a black person is talking, so nobody roll your eyes. <laughs> <Jesus>. <laughs> Apparently, that's a microaggression. Misogynoir. This is, this is a new type of misogyny, which is where you, where you hate women, that's misogyny, and where you hate black women, that's misogynoir. <laughs> So they come up with all these, new, uh, all these new terminology. That's why they're always telling you to educate yourself because they have new words. Misgendering, I mean, this is no joke. A school district in uh, Missouri has just had to pay $4 million to this man who said he was a girl when he was at school. And the school said, no, you're a boy. And he's, no, I'm a girl. And they wouldn't accept that. He sued them and he got a payout of $4 million. So it isn't a joke. This is why I was saying penalties attached to it, penalties attached to civil rights. And then I just took the example of anti-Semitism and Islamophobia because the two lobbies are clashing. 
One lobby says that's anti-Semitic and the other lobby says, no, it's Islamophobia. They both want special protection from the state for you know, the hate that's directed against them. So now we have a new anti-Semitism Awareness Act. This is to protect people from hate against uh, Jewish people. And now the Muslims are saying, oh, we want our anti-Muslim awareness act because they're saying, well, we're suffering from hate as well. And on and on it goes. And the point is that many people seem to find this very beguiling. They are, they think, oh, this should work. And one of the points that um, Mises has made about these types of incursions on our liberties by the state is that we must be alert to the fact that their terminology terminology is frequently changing. They used to call it anti-discrimination, then they started to call it social justice, and then now they call it uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And now that many states, such as Alabama, have banned uh, DEI, they're changing the words again. Now they call it community, opportunity, and belonging. And it's exactly the same thing. And so this is what Mises is warning about. The socialist movement takes great pains to circulate frequently new labels for its ideally constructed state. Each worn out label is replaced by another until it becomes obvious that nothing has been changed but the name. So it's really important to defend our liberties without regard to the exact words that they might be uh, using to assault our liberties. This uh, war against uh, hate crime at the, is now, you can hear it at the highest level. Kamala Harris, I don't really follow what she says because she's going to lose the, debate, the, the election anyway, but <laughs> one of the things that she was saying she's going to do is she's going to get the Justice Department to start enforcing what she calls real justice. And she said she's going to double the Civil Rights Division so that they can do even more civil rights enforcement. And what's really interesting is that they accuse the Trump administration of having used the uh, civil rights department of the Justice Department, civil rights division of the Justice Department to enforce the letter of the law. That's their accusation. <laughs> they're, saying that, they're saying that Trump Department of Justice weaponized the Civil Rights Division to enforce the letter of the Civil Rights Act. And they're saying that that is wrong and dangerous because when you're enforcing civil rights, you shouldn't follow what the law says, as Mr. Trump wrongly did. You should follow what we all know is the purpose of the Civil Rights Act, which is what they call black power. It doesn't say that in the Civil Rights Act, but they're saying you should know that if you educated yourself. And, and it's really interesting to see that now there are, we're increasingly having laws that make following the law illegal. So the law says you must not vote if you're not a citizen, but now California has a law saying that if you enforce that law, that's illegal. You cannot ask anybody whether they're a citizen or not, because now that's illegal in California. It's becoming illegal to do anything legal. And this is the way that we see uh, the, civil rights, uh, the civil rights enforcement working. And I think this is a very good summary of what's going on. Uh, Lou Rockwell says, the goal of the state is to find some practice that is universally reviled. So in this case, this idea of hate, everybody hates hate. Although somebody told me he hates people who say they hate hate. <laughs> uh, so, so the state finds a practice that is universally reviled and poses the one and only way of expunging it from society. So the state is not just saying hate is bad. The state is saying only the state can expunge hate from society. And in order to do that, you need very many different laws and that's where the civil rights framework comes in. To give you an example of anti-hate uh, legislation that we've re recently seen, again from California. Sorry to dunk on California, if there's anyone here from California. Uh, 
They've got this new law called uh, the anti-hate littering. So this is because people will suffer from hate littering. Now you might think, well, littering isn't a good thing. Littering means a pamphlet. So this is probably hate litter at this point. <laughs> hate littering <laughs> is if you have a pamphlet that has hate in it, all right? So this one says, again, our enemy, the state. So that's hate literature. So they say flyers, leaflets, pamphlets, that's hate litter. People might see it and they might read it and the state is going to protect them from that with their anti-hate uh, anti littering law. It's against the dissemination of materials like flyers or pamphlets containing threatening speech to intimidate people, because you might feel intimidated if you hear that people want to abolish the state. And uh, just to give another example that's not just from California, but New York has uh, the same law. So we're not just dunking on California the whole time. Yeah. Well, uh, so New York has a, a department of hate uh, enforcement, which is part of the hate crime, uh, hate crime enforcement. And this department, the department of hate, it's like a hate finder whose job is to see where the hate is going on in New York, and they have, a, they have a list where they put hate symbols. So if your symbol goes on the hate list, that means that showing it is a hate crime. And hate crime means you go to jail. And one uh, on this uh, list of hate symbols is the, the Confederate battle flag. And the reason it ended up on the New York hate list was because some fire service in one of the New York counties in a parade had the Confederate battle flag on their fire engine and somebody felt offended at seeing it and called the state authorities who put the flag on their hate list. And this is what I'm trying to say. It's about the state getting involved in people saying, I don't wanna see this, the state needs to come in and protect me from having to see things that I prefer not to see. So how can, we, how can we resolve this? So many people say the way to resolve this is by having more law. So you can have more laws that protect people from these anti-hate laws. And I just want to suggest that that is not the correct approach. The correct approach is not to have more laws, but to get rid of the existing bad laws. We should have less law and not more law. Uh, somebody commenting. <laughs> Somebody commenting on the state of affairs in New York, this was when they harnessed the law to prosecute Donald Trump for, they called it spreading lies. They said you're spreading lies about the election and they used the law to prosecute him and many lawyers in New York said that is the end of the rule of law when it's weaponized by one side against the other. And the solution to this is not more law but less law, we already have too much law. And I just wanted to share with you um, a quote from Richard, uh, Richard A. Epstein, who's a professor of law at uh, Columbia, who says, we have too much law. There is too much law, and most of it is designed to resolve problems created by having too much law. <laughs> right? because people think that that's the way to fix things. I do have some sympathy with that view. I know that, for example, in Alabama, as I say, they've banned DEI, they've banned teaching children critical race theories, where you tell them if you're white, you're bad, and if you're black, you're good, that's banned. They've banned boys going in girls' uh, bathrooms and locker rooms. I have some sympathy with that approach because they think, if uh, these critical race theory people attack us, we will, enact new laws to attack them back. Then it becomes a fight, and there are Trump supporters saying that now. Oh, they weaponized the Department of Justice against us, just you wait. When we win the election, we'll weaponize the Justice Department against them, see how they like their own weapons. This is not the right approach. We should have less law. So this is what Richard Epstein says. We expect too much from the law. We assume that every social problem needs a new law to fix it. He says the level of aspiration for law in the United States is simply too high. We try to solve more and more problems by legal rules and fewer through voluntary accommodation. 
we need to go back to freedom and the principles of freedom in deciding how to solve these problems. And this is the point that Lou Rockwell makes in Against the State. And uh, Lou Rockwell says, what freedom has illustrated is that differences among people do not need to lead to intractable conflicts. Otherwise, we're just endlessly fighting. We win the election, we fight you, and then you win the election, you fight back at us. He says more and more social cooperation is possible and fruitful to the extent that people are granted the freedom to associate, to trade, to make contracts, and to work together toward their mutual advantage. So we need to be moving towards liberty and not to <laughs> vengeance. Uh, through the state. We shouldn't be weaponizing the state against each other. We should be moving towards liberty. Now, how, do, how would we do that? Rothbard has already explained how you do that. He says there is another alternative for law in society, an alternative not only to administrative decree or statutory legislation, but even to judge-made law. That alternative is libertarian law, based on the criterion that violence may only be used against those who initiate violence. You don't initiate violence against people because you don't like the flag that they're displaying. And this should be based on the inviolability of the person and property of every individual from invasion by violence. And that will be the only measure for what the law should achieve. And Rothbard says, this means in practice, taking the largely libertarian common law. So he's saying the principles of common law developed by judges in the courts over the centuries uh, broadly conform to libertarian principles. So we don't have to start from square one. We're not starting with a clean slate. We've got the common law. We correct it by use of man's reason. This is just where you decide to follow uh, one case rather than another based on your reason of what's better. And he proposes also that it should be enshrined as a permanently fixed libertarian code or constitution. Permanently fixed meaning not this whole, the problem we have at the moment is that people say the constitution is a living, breathing tree, you know, and every day it evolves depending on what's going on. And you can't have a law that is constantly evolving depending on the people involved in the case. That's what Rothbard means here by permanently fixed libertarian code or constitution with continual interpretation and application by experts and judges in privately competitive courts. So Rothbard is a, um, an anarchist, an, an anarcho-capitalist. This book is the Anarcho-Capitalist Manifesto. So he says that the courts should be privately competitive courts and not uh, what we have at the moment, which is uh, state courts and judges who use um, the law as a weapon against their political enemies. Thank you.